We've enjoyed this fabulous prelude and the chime. We've settled into our places. We're already beginning to experience the presence of the living God. He has called us and set us apart through Jesus Christ, and now we are his own. And now he promises to be with us where two or more are gathered together in the name of Christ. Come, hear the voice of God. Come, experience the peace of Christ. Come and know the living God who will heal us, who will forgive us, and who will grant his mercy to us. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Greet one another. standing and turn in your worship guide to the morning litany this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 15. We'll read together responsively. I'll read the light print if you would respond together by reading with me the bold print. Following the litany, we'll sing our opening hymn, number 319. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. We are cleansed by the word that Christ has spoken, and we abide in him as he abides in us. And just as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, neither can we unless we abide in him. God the Father is glorified as we become his disciples. If we keep his commandments, we will abide in his love, just as he kept his Father's commandments and abided in his love. God speaks that his joy may be in us and that our joy may be complete. Out of that abundance of joy, we give God our love, our thanks, and our praise. Praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of all creation.
be seated. Pray with me, please. O oh Lord, we join the heavenly chorus this morning and declare that truly you are worthy to be praised. O oh, living God, you have created all things and have sustained all things. O oh, Lamb of God, Christ, you too are truly worthy because you've given yourself on our behalf so that we might become a nation of priests so that we might become the people of God. Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory, majesty, dominion, power before all time, now and forevermore. And now we pray, Lord, that you would enable our worship. We pray that we would truly bow the knee before you so that we might give you the thanks and worship that you alone are, are properly due. O Lord, we declare with the great prophet John that Behold, when we see Christ, we see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We declare with the Apostle Paul that Christ, our, our Passover Lamb, has been offered on our behalf. O oh Lord, we declare that Christ is the living Lord before whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is worthy of all praise. O oh God, we declare that we are your people. We claim the mercies that you've offered us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray now that we would experience the blessing of your forgiveness. We pray that we would experience the conviction regarding our sins. And we pray that we would experience anew and afresh this day the joy of our salvation. O oh Lord, for these mercies, for these blessings, for your kindness to us, for your healing, for your watch care, for your guidance, we give you thanks and praise through the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. To invite now our preschoolers, uh, any that are here up through about age five or so. Some of them are already, I think, where they need to be. Uh, if there are those uh, in the room, though, that would like to join uh, Miss Tara and Mr. Phil for a very special lesson, they can uh, find them, I think, uh, across the hall today uh, in the nursery. Uh, they'll rejoin us later uh, at the end of the service. Um, as they uh, do that, it is uh, also a pleasure for me to introduce uh, to you uh, uh, some one and some some uh, people that you may not know and, and something that you may not even know is, is going on. Um, 
months ago, uh, I met uh, a guy named Mace Perez, and we met through uh, Theology on Tap when it was uh, hosted here at Heights Church, and uh, he shared with me this, uh, this vision that he had. He shared with me this call that he believed that God had placed on his life to plant a new church and a very specific, uh, a very specific kind of church, uh, and I'm going to let him tell you in a moment a little bit more about that, but um, I, I will tell you that we are not the uh, mother church. Or, or, the, or the sponsoring church. However, uh, for the last few months, it has been our great pleasure to be uh, the, the host church. So uh, this church called The Journey, uh, our meeting here uh, at Heights Church on Sunday afternoons, uh, they've been doing so for a while, and, and I hope they will stay with us uh, for quite some time. Uh, I look forward to sh- uh, letting you hear from, uh, from Mace, but also uh, hopefully speaking to some of their uh, church members after the service. Mace, would you come and just tell us a little bit about... Uh, the journey so that then we can pray for you. Yeah, thank you, Eddie. Uh, Good morning, everybody. My name is Mace Perez, and I'm one of the pastors of The Journey. And just want to say thank you to Heights Church and y'all's hospitality. Everybody that we've interacted with has just been so wonderful and supportive and encouraging and so generous with your time, your your words of encouragement and support, and of course, your, your beautiful building. So thank you for welcoming us here. Um, the story of the journey really starts with my story, and the short version is is that for much of my life growing up, I didn't believe in Christianity. I thought it was a bunch of wishful thinking with no rational, logical, historical reasons to believe. And uh, frankly, I thought some of the teachings of Christianity were kind of backwoods and repressive. But the Lord in his kindness and grace met me through a handful of, of key people who loved Jesus took time to get to know me, love me, hear out all my questions and my doubts and my skepticism, sometimes not even asked in good faith. And the Lord began to break down the walls of my mind and my heart and show me that we do have reason to believe the true claims of Christianity. And I came to see the beauty of the gospel of grace. And so we set out to plant a church to reach people like the Mace Perez's of of the past, people that um, are skeptics, that are cynical, that they've maybe never been in church before, or maybe they were in church and they've left church because they're, they're hurt or they, they don't understand um, the beauty of what it is that we believe. And so we wanna reach people like that. And so our hearts broke um, for people like who I was. And so we wanted to plant a church in the heart of our city, knowing that those people aren't gonna just walk through our doors um, accidentally, that we need to inspire and equip the people of God to go out to them and invite them on a journey to discover the truth, goodness, and beauty of the Christian story. And so super thankful for Heights Church and the many churches in our city that are partnering with us and supporting us. Super grateful for my co-pastor, Stephen, and, all, and a handful of our covenant members who are able to be here this morning. And again, grateful um, that y'all have allowed us to join you and worship with you this morning. Thank you, Mace. Uh, if you're if you're part of the journey at all, would you would you just stand so that we uh, we well, we'd like to pray for you, uh, but we want to be able to identify uh, who you are. Uh, and and if you would let me let me lead us in a brief uh, prayer for for these, uh, not just uh, Mace uh, and Stephen, but but for all that uh, are there and who will come. Uh, let's let's join our hearts and minds together. Our heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you bring uh, people and ideas and inspirations and callings into our lives. We're grateful that you equip us with the strength and the courage and the wisdom to follow those ideas, those callings. And so, especially today, we thank you for the gift of the journey. We thank you for the gift of this idea, the gift of this inspiration. We pray specifically for these pastors, as they uh, break new ground, as they lead in uncharted waters, as they lead in what may feel like darkness, would you always for them be the light? Would you, would you remind them of your presence with them? Would you remind them that you offer peace in every situation, in every decision, in every struggle, uh, in every uh, piece of, of confusion or, uh, or uncertainty, that you are their rock and that you are their peace. We thank you for blessing this church with the opportunity to minister together with these. And we ask that you continue to bless their efforts, that you continue to, uh, to inspire them, 
not just today, but every day forward as they continue to strive to serve you. All these things we pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thank you. Our Old Testament lesson is from Leviticus 7. 
11 through 15. That's on page 72 in the Old Testament portion of your pew Bible, in, in case you want to look at that. So it's Leviticus 7, 11 through 15. This is the ritual of the sacrifice of the offering of well-being, that one may offer it to the Lord. If you offer it for thanksgiving, you shall offer with the thank offering unleavened cakes mixed with oil, unleavened wafers spread with oil, and cakes of choice flour well soaked in oil. With your thanksgiving offering of well-being, you shall bring your offering with cakes of leavened bread. From this you shall offer one cake for each offering as a gift to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who dashes the blood of the offering of the well-being. And the flesh of your thanksgiving sacrifice of well-being shall not be eaten on the day it's offered. You shall not leave any of it until morning. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament lesson is from 1 Thessalonians 5. 12 through 24. First Thessalonians 5, 12 through 24. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and, and admonish you. Esteem them very highly among yourselves because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't quench the Spirit, Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. The one who, excuse me, uh, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. This is the word of the Lord. You may have noticed the common denominator in those two texts. From Leviticus 7, it's, a, it's an offering for thanksgiving. And from 1 Thessalonians 5, it's a call from Paul to do all things with praise and thanksgiving. I want to talk about um, thanksgiving and gratitude a little bit. And I also want to talk a little bit about um, um, what this can um, uh, do for us both psychologically and can do for us as a, as a community together. Um, who strives to worship God with gratitude and live our lives with gratitude. Um, The temple in Israel's life was an imposing structure. Um, We've talked about it a lot um, uh, in both Bible study and here, but the temple, as you know, um, was just an incredibly large structure. I mean, imagine multiple football fields worth of courtyards and stone, um, and, 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 and throughout the year, throughout the day, constant activity. Um, with music and offerings and people thronging to it for all sorts of reasons. Um, One thing that we can often do with the temple mistakenly is to reduce it to a bunch of bloody sort of arcane rites that we don't do anymore because they're gross and we just don't do that stuff anymore. Um, And another way that we can uh, misunderstand the temple and the rites that happen there is to reduce the rituals to simply offerings that someone brought when they committed an offense. Simply offerings that you brought um, in order to procure uh, purification or forgiveness. Um, clearly, those are aspects of it. Those are one of the offerings. You bring an offering for when you commit a certain kind of sin, and you're, and you're promised by God that he'll give you uh, purification and, 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 and atonement and forgiveness. Um, but if we reduce the offerings to that, we actually reduce the offerings and the temple itself to just one component of its many, many components. So I want to paint a different picture of what the temple actually, uh, or the bigger picture of what the temple is. The temple itself is, of course, the residence of God among his people because it's God's own goal that he dwell in the midst of his people. You get this picture from Exodus 25 when God had called Moses to the top of Sinai and said, Moses, I want you all to build a, a tent down there and I will dwell in it because it's God's own goal to dwell with his people. 
But within this, um, there's lots of sacrifices and rituals and, 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 and offerings and festivals that in the grand scheme are actually um, moments of joy and fellowship with each other and with God. So when we reduce the offering simply to a moment when, okay, I've done wrong, now I have to go make up for it, um, that's obviously there. But when you reduce it to that, you miss this big picture in which it's God's dwelling with his people and he wants his people to come have fellowship with each other and with him. So I, the, the picture rather is that I want you to have is, is uh, imagine a, a multiple times a year um, gathering together with your family and you've got caravans of people flocking to Jerusalem together for a feast and as they approach, they're belting out poetical tunes, singing songs together to get their hearts and minds ready for their worship to be in the presence of their living God. Walking together for days, basically a mobile party for multiple days until you get there. And as you're approaching, you're singing songs with joy. And when you get there, it's a feast and a festival. This is the picture that the temple, um, this is the picture of the temple in the life of Israel. It's more akin, honestly, to our, our own gatherings. If, you're, if you happen to enjoy um, getting together with your family during Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter, or whatever parts of that, if that's a moment of joy for you, then that's actually the, the way that you should liken this um, in the life of Israel. Um, to, to gathering together with excitement for a feast because you're getting together with people you love. Imagine this. I mean, so, you, so you, I mentioned that as they approach, what they would often do is they would approach in caravans, singing songs together as they approach. There's a handful of psalms that are called the songs of ascent. Scholars think that they were either sung by the people as they approached in a caravan or sung by the priests as the people approach. But in either way, they're, they're songs that are being sung uh, as a community to, to, to get excited about uh, the fact that they're all approaching the temple where God lives. So just listen to a couple of them. This is, this is Psalm um, 126, and they're all quite short. Um, this is, excuse me, Psalm one, um, no, 126. Um, they're all quite short, and I'm going to read a few in a row. It says, um, when Yahweh restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, our, our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, Yahweh has done great things for them. Yahweh has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Yahweh, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Or Psalm 133, how very good and pleasant is it when the kindred who live together in unity. It's like precious oil on the head running down upon the beard. On the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes, it's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion. For there, Yahweh ordained his blessing and life forevermore. Or the last one, um, come, bless Yahweh, all you servants of Yahweh. You who stand by night in the house of Yahweh, lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May Yahweh, maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Notice, imagine this, this throng of people approaching God, singing these, I mean, these are, I'm, I'm reading it in English, and it's written in he, Hebrew poetry. I mean, it's poetical songs. Imagine these people singing this as they approach, and as they approach, they're getting ready to slaughter animals for a festival, for a party. This is the picture that, that, they, that, they, that they have uh, of, of the role of the temple in the life of Israel. And so what I want you to do is think of this as a spot of joy and thanksgiving where they go to celebrate the many mighty acts of God. When they get there, there are rituals that are somewhat, there's a handful that are somewhat somber in Leviticus 16. It's the Day of Atonement, and it's a ritual that it's quite somber. Um, they're supposed to actually fast, um, and they don't do, um, and they, 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 it's not a, quite a, joyous festival like the rest of them are. But a lot of the others are quite joyous and festival. They're, they're, they're getting there to, to remember all the mighty acts of God's salvation. I mean, think of Passover. Right? It's a time in which um, they've got a lot of little rituals that sound funny to us because we don't do them anymore. But to them, it's just, A, it's just sort of their way of life and it's easy to do. But also B, it's like, no, we're, we're coming to eat a meal together with our extended family that we haven't seen and we're celebrating the fact that God rescued us from Egypt. It's a moment of recalling the many mighty acts of God. Not only that, on top of the annual festivals that they come to multiple times a year, there's also a sacrifice that they can give spontaneously. Again, I talked about how if you reduce the sacrifices simply to things for atonement and for forgiveness, then you would, you would actually miss what a lot of the sacrificial system is doing. 
Because the sacrificial system is also a means through which the people can just spontaneously express their thanks and joy toward God. This is what you see, the, the, the text I read, it says, now if the person's offering is a well-being offering or a peace offering, in other words, it's just a spontaneous gift that they bring. They're either at peace with God or maybe they're making some sort of petition to be at peace and they just bring this spontaneous gift. Or similarly, uh, the, thanksgiving off, the Thanksgiving offering, it's exactly what it sounds like. You're thankful for something and you simply want to express this gratitude. And so you bring it to the, to the temple, you make the offering, and you get to eat part of it. The portion goes to the priest because it's their only way that they get to eat food. Uh, they eat from the offerings. But you're basically bringing an offering that you yourself get to eat. So you bring this Thanksgiving offering as an expression of your gratitude, and it's the perfect picture. It's actually the perfect picture of the way God relates to his people because it's an offering that you're giving to God, but God doesn't need stuff. And so what does God do? It's an offering where you're expressing your gratitude to God and you get to eat it. It's an offering where you're expressing your gratitude to God, but you get to eat it with joy with your family. God doesn't have these needs. We're not meeting a need for him. He's meeting our needs. And this is the grammar of the biblical text in all moments. We're not bringing a gift to twist his arm and say, God, if I bring you this, maybe then you'll be gracious to me. It's the opposite. God's been gracious, and so he brings this gift of gratitude that he then gives back to you and says, you, now you enjoy it. All right. This is, this, I, I, I emphasize this because this is, this is I, said that, I, I use that phrase, the grammar. This is the grammar of the Bible, and of course it's repeated in the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't invent this idea. It's, it's, it's just encoded in Leviticus itself, and it's the way that, of course, uh, lots of New Testament authors, but particularly Paul talks about it, uh, that, that our life is a life of gratitude, ex- live in, uh, lived uh, as, as, as an expression of our gratefulness for all the things that God has done for us. That God has done such great things for us through his son and through the gift of his spirit. He says that while we were weak, while we were hostile, while we were sinners, while we were running away from God, at the right time, Christ died for us. A lot of people won't even die for a good man. Maybe someone will die for a righteous man. God demonstrated his own love for us in that while you were weak and a sinner and helpless is when Christ died for you. That's when God showed you his love for you to show you that his love was given not because you merited it, but precisely because to demonstrate the greatness of his own love. And Paul says, with this thinking in mind that Christ has done all these great things for us, so now we live our life with gratitude. So go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, and you'll see it again. He says it multiple times, but in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, in all things, give thanks. That because of the, the, the way he says it in Ephesians is, is beautiful. He says, uh, because of the great love with which he loved us, we give thanks to God. And it, it typically, not always, but typically punctuates Paul's letters. He says, I'm always thanking God for you all. I'm always expressing my gratitude to God for the gift of your faith, etc." Or here, as he's admonishing his, his or not admonishing, uh, encouraging his, the congregation to say, look, live your life with gratitude. So what I want to do now, um, I think, I hope, I hope you sort of get the big theological picture here that, of course, God has acted, and so as a result, we respond with, with thanksgiving. And this is the grammar of both Old Testament and New, Test- New Testament, that God has done these gracious things for us, um, and that our life is one that both we live in gratitude, but also to think of our life as a life that basically speaks a word. I mean, the, the way that Paul took, says it in Romans 14 is that we'll give an account of our life. The word is actually, a, it says you'll give, a, you'll give a word for your life. In other words, Paul, Paul uh, reflecting on life, re- realizes that our, our life speaks a word. That others will, uh, will see the way that we live our life and they'll get a picture of it. They'll say, okay, that, that's a really uh, nice person, a really sweet person, a really generous person, a really funny person, or really whatever. Paul's picture is, I want you to be the kind of person when they see that's a really grateful person. That our life speaks a word, and that word should be one of gratitude for God and gratitude toward each other, because we ought to be living in fellowship. 
Um, so in, in, the, in the time that remains, um, what I want to do is talk a, a little bit about knowing that, okay, we're supposed to live our lives with gratitude. I, I wanted to look into um, 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 benefits that, that, that gratitude brings. I'd, I'd heard this myself, and so I wanted to look into it. And so there are actually lots of studies that have been done on the ways in which gratitude can affect you emotionally, psychologically, and, and, and physically even. Um, and so there's um, uh, a few things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to note, and you just um, tell me if any of these register with you. This one was reported in Harvard Health. It's a study that was from a professor at the University of California in Miami. Um, it says uh, that people who, who practiced gratitude, and the way that they practiced was that the study was, okay, you 10 people um, every day write what you're thankful for. You over here, you write what made you mad today. <laughs> and you over here, just sort of describe your day and don't make any, any qualifications. Just describe what happened to you today, good or bad. And the study reported that those who focused on the good things and, 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 and expressed their gratitude for the things that had happened to them in the day, this is what happened. So they had reported lower levels of stress, lower levels of anxiety, um, lower levels of uh, substance dependence, that was itself driven by stress. Another study followed a similar pattern and found that people actually had fewer aches and pains because they're, they were quite literally, it was, it was impacting what they thought about and consequently um, uh, what they thought about when they were going to sleep. And so they gave them better sleep. So that as a result, they were more well rested. And that as a result, it actually created a desire for them to exercise more, which then had net benefits, right? So I'm not presenting, pre presenting these things as some sort of a silver bullet, like, hey, if you just write everything down you're thankful for, like, all your problems are going to go away. Um, that's obviously not what I'm saying. But I'm saying it's, it's interesting that you have these kinds of psychological and physical benefits that result from gratitude, and it shouldn't be surprising to us if we actually do believe that, A, God made our bodies, and he himself advises gratitude. You shouldn't be surprised when the two connect up that our bodies actually do work well when we're living within God's own will for that gratitude. Um, there are actually others as well. I mean, it, the, the, some of the most basic, one, basic ones that won't be surprising to you are that it also just uh, created cohesion among relationships. It, it, it said people reported higher career satisfaction because what they did is they were intentional about being grateful for their colleagues and just trying to think about, okay, what does this person do that I don't do that I'm really grateful for? So it created cohesion between colleagues. Uh, and of course, uh, relationships generally. The study focused on married couples, but it, it, they extrapolated, extrapolated outward toward all relationships, where you focus on the things you're grateful for in your various relationships, whatever it is. And of course, I mean, it's not, not hard to imagine. Like if I, if I, all I do, right, if all I do is think about all the ways that this person over here makes me mad, then like... <laughs> Like, obviously, I'm going to be mad at them next time I see them. I'm going to start thinking of making up things to be mad at them about, right? But if you think about all the things I'm grateful for, I mean, all these things this person does that I'm grateful for, all the, all the good benefits and blessings they bring in my life, whatever it is, whether it's you know, my, my wife or my kids or my parents or my coworkers here or, or at the university, whatever it is, think about all the things that they're, they're a blessing to me. And it creates a heart in which I want to express gratitude to them. I want to be thankful for them. And of course, and what it does is, is then, as a result, I do then express that gratitude. And what happens to you? What happens to you when someone is intentional about expressing their gratefulness for what you do? What do you think it does to you? It makes you grateful. It softens your heart. It makes you want to be like, yeah, okay, we, you know. You're great too, <laughs> you know. Like I mean, it, 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 it's not surprising. None of this is a mystery, right? But notice then, like notice, uh, notice then what, what this does is not only is it sort of living within God's own will for you, like He's done all these things for you, and so we ought to express our lives uh, as as one of gratefulness toward Him. But because God has created us and we are wired for gratitude, as it were, it makes sense that when we are, live our lives with gratefulness, it also creates a more peaceful environment in which we can live well with our fellow people. I think of this all the time. Uh, so what often happens to me and Meg in this particular um, situation, and so don't worry, if you've ever said this to us, don't worry, I'm not judging you. But uh, uh, something that happens often, right, something that happens often when people are talking to parents of young kids is, hey, don't worry, it'll get better. <laughs> like, 
Like, I know it's crazy now, right? So, right, we have a five, so if you all don't know, I have a five-year-old, you may have met, I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and about to be a one-year-old, so. <clears throat> and um, everyone, so it obviously looks crazy sometimes, right? Like, I'll be trying to talk to somebody. I, I, I almost tripped over Kate's purse this morning, and I kind of, like, kicked it out of the way. And then, like, the whole church noticed, like, oh, you kicked the purse. <laughs> I was like, what? I was just trying to, okay. Uh, it can feel crazy at times, right? Um, and that's like the least of it, right? I mean, often the worst of it, right, is like, so the baby gets up every like three hours or something and you haven't slept through the night in, in like, you know, five years. Um, and it can feel crazy. And so people can try to encourage you, like, hey, don't worry, it'll get better. And I understand that. So if you've ever said that, don't worry. Don't, I'm not judging you. But I, I, Meg and I have tried hard actually to not think of it at all that way. Of course, it could be easy to be like, yeah, I just got to gut through this period, and maybe then once they're 10, it'll be fun or something like that, you know? Um, A, that's obviously, A, just not true. <laughs> but also B, because 10-year-olds are also crazy, but also B, like, this is the only time I'll have them like this. It'd be really easy, and it, 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 you know, this happens a lot. It'd be really easy for me to, or Meg, right? Uh, and this is actually, this is something very beautiful about Meg. Um, our one-year-old does not sleep very much. Not a great sleeper at night. And Meg has to often get up. I don't think Meg has slept through the night in five years, actually. Like, maybe not in five years. And so I'm always, I feel so bad, right? Because she's getting up all the time. She's getting up all the time to, like, take care of this, this, this kiddo that doesn't sleep. And, you know, it'd be easy for Meg to complain about it. And I'm not kidding. She doesn't. Do you know what she does instead? That baby can stay in here, by the way. She's not bothering anybody. He's not bothering anybody. Well, you know what she does instead? She goes, eh, this is the only time I'll get to do this. This is the only time I'll, like, she wants me. I'm going to go in and hold her. It's the only time, I'll, I'll never get this again. Same, same, same with, with, with Elizabeth now, right? Right now, she always wants me to hold her, which is the only one, somehow, the only one who's wanted that. But she's the, she always wants me to hold her. <laughs> and, it, you know, throughout the day, it gets a little bit, and you're like, okay, really? Like, again? Like, I've tried to, you know, flip a pancake or whatever, but I'm like, okay this is the only time she's ever going to want to do that consistently all the time. So instead of like having that complaining spirit about it, which I could do easily and which it's easy for people to do, you know, I get it. Instead, when I'm just like, ah, oh, great. Just, I'm so grateful that my little one-year-old wants me to hold her. And so I, I try to do it every time, you know. Now, my point is, to take it back to Meg and take it back to what we're talking about here, is that like, you, you, all, you almost always... Now, I know there are truly terrible things, and I'm not trying to, like, make all of life one big, you know, e e easy hardship. Uh, but oftentimes, you, you, you have a choice about how to react to something. You, it'd be easy to react pessimistically, negatively, only complainingly, right? I'm not saying that you can't ever recognize when something's bad. Bad stuff happens, you can recognize that, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that. But oftentimes if you can get a sort of a big picture view of it, if you can get, you know, a step back and look at a big picture view of something, and if you can find the way in which you can be grateful for it or grateful for whatever this new, you know, moment is bringing, it will reorient your own interpretation of it and reorient how you react to it, and it will create sort of just more cohesion in either the household or the, or the family or the relationships or whatever. And so it's not a silver bullet, right? You, you can hear all these psychological benefits. I'm not saying this is a silver bullet. If you just write down everything you're thankful for, you'll never be sad again, right? But I am saying it does make sense that when we live our lives with gratitude, it makes an impact not only in our own hearts and minds, but also with the people around us. And that we do this not simply reductively for the psychological or emotional benefits, but also because this is how we ought to think of our own lives. That God has done these things for us that God has created this community in which we can live in fellowship with him and each other, and that that ought to create a heart in us that is, recognizes there's many good gifts that he's given us that we haven't earned and that yet we live in freely. And so in all things, give thanks. We've been redeemed by a God who loves us. We've been redeemed by a God who wants to be in our midst. God's actions are not reductively actions that glorify him, though they do that. God's actions do glorify him. Um, nor are our actions sort of simply twisting God's arm to get him to want to be close to us. 
The grammar is always reversed. It is God's own desire and God's own intention that he be with his people whom he created and loves. It's our joy to get to join in the fellowship of families thronging to worship toward God in this, in this joyful journey. And so in this journey, our life speaks a word, and a resounding note in that word ought to be gratitude and thanksgiving. So we approach God not with shiny gifts to, 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 that might tempt him to be gracious after all. God has been gracious, and so we approach him with thanksgiving. For while we were weak, while we were hostile, while we were sinners, God demonstrated his own love toward us and joined us to, to himself. I'll pray. Father in heaven, thanks for this day. Thanks for this time together. Thanks for this chance to worship together. Thank you for your many gifts that you've given us in your son and in your spirit and in this community of fellowship. Um, help us to love one another well and to be at peace with one another and to express our gratitude um, toward each other and toward you for all the many gifts you've given to us. We love you, Lord. We trust you. We pray these things in the name of your son who loved us. Amen. Indeed, we have heard a word from the Lord today, uh, and because we have, we must respond. Uh, for some uh, here today, the, the response may be uh, to answer a call that you feel from God to follow Christ in the waters of baptism. Uh, for someone else, it could be a, a call to join this church. Still, others uh, could simply need to come to this altar to pray. But we will all respond in some way, at the very least, or perhaps the very greatest, we will commit ourselves now in a moment uh, to being better followers of Christ uh, from today until the next time we meet together. We'll sing a hymn of thanksgiving, a hymn of praise, number 295, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Would you stand with me? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you with open hearts of gratitude, honoring you for the blessing you stored upon us through giving of our tithes and offerings. We remember your promise to open the floodgates of heaven with our first fruits. May this offering be of extension of your kingdom in your church and community 
we ask of your guidance and wisdom to help us understand it's better to give than receive. Inspire us to embrace the joy and blessing that come from selfless giving, mirroring the generous spirit of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for being here this morning for this hour, being part of the Heights Church family, and that includes our brothers and sisters from the journey. Uh, I want to remind you of a couple of things that are uh, happening today and soon. Uh, immediately following worship, Bible journaling is happening uh, in the third floor gallery. Uh, it's open to all. Anyone can come. You don't even have to bring anything. Everything's there for you. Uh, join uh, them in a, a short devotion and then uh, artistic expression uh, of the scripture. Uh, it's a wonderful time. Um, 
as well while you're up there. If you missed it last Sunday, you can see the current uh, Artifacts Gallery show, uh, art by Gene Barron and Ray Dunlap. That's uh, hanging currently, uh, and Robin will be there. Uh, you can uh, ask her anything you, that you need to about the art. As well, a kind of a bit of a surprise, the Trinity Classical School art show is also hanging in the third floor hallway. So uh, go up there, even if you don't plan to go to Bible journaling, uh, take a minute to go upstairs and see their wonderful art and, uh, and thank God for these uh, children that are here every week uh, who are learning so, so much. Um, finally, I want to remind you that if you have a teenager uh, that would like to go to Young Life or Wildlife Camp, Please speak to me soon. Uh, uh, Gene, thanks for mentioning that, that Adam would like to go. I know we've got some Maddoxes coming and maybe some cousins as well. If there's someone else you know uh, that's in any way connected to the church, please let us, uh, let us help send them to Young Life or, or Wildlife Camp. Uh, finally. Uh, lots of new people today. Church members, please don't leave uh, the building uh, until you've met at least two new people. Uh, and I want you especially to come and encourage uh, our brothers and sisters of the journey. Uh, they'll be meeting uh, for their regular service uh, later this afternoon uh, on the third floor. So we want to continue to pray for them. Now, uh, oh, also Delaney and Benji, thank you so much. Um, what a... What a treat uh, to have you. Thank you for uh, so much that, that you added uh, to our worship. Uh, and there's one final thing. Uh, I am so happy to see Karen Smith. I have, we have not seen Karen Smith here since March of 2020. Uh, and uh, that is a, that's too long. And she said, I can't believe you recognize me. How could I not? Um, we miss you. We, we pray for you all the time. We have missed you so much. We're so glad you're here. And I understand we have Kay to thank for uh, giving Karen a ride this morning. And that is a wonderful thing. I hope y'all can keep doing that on Sunday mornings. That's a real blessing. Uh, amen. It is an answered prayer. Answered prayer for you and for us as well, Karen. Uh, if if uh, church members come and, come and see uh, Karen also and encourage her and thank, and thank Kay for giving her a ride. Now, uh, you will receive your benediction. And following that, you'll be dismissed. And now may we be a people of gratitude whose minds are quick to remember the mercies and blessings of God, whose hearts have been softened by his kindness toward us, and whose habits of life show forth the glory of God. Go in the Lordship of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit to serve the living God with gratitude. Amen.